Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, our third session of the, uh, the Core in Action Programme, Semester 2, in which we are reading The Embodied Mind, the, the seminal text for the inactive approach to cognitive science. Um, so I, I, at this point, I, I wonder if we might um, need a sort of a previously on Core in Action section, uh, just to uh, try and keep some sense of the big picture, even as we step through the details uh, so, uh, so very briefly, I guess we've we touched in the, the first session on how the inactive approach to cognitive science involves a recognition of the indivisibility within cognitive science of the knower, those of us, you know, that's, that's us, the agents, the known, it's the world around us, but also ourselves and other people and the means of knowing. And um, that investigating or indeed altering any of these terms inescapably involves investigating or altering all of the others too. We've also seen how Varela, Thompson and Roche identified the need to examine experience in a disciplined way that both recognizes the importance of experience, its necessity, without committing either to a reduction of it or to a naive description of or an unexamined acceptance of, of experience. And so in our previous session, Philippe Luan showed us how rich the European tradition of phenomenology is on this issue. In fact, um, in, in, in a critical reading of the embodied mind on that front and address some of the ways in which we can critically understand both the Husserlian tradition uh, and Varela Thompson and Rush's perspective on the role of experience in the production of knowledge, its, its role in epistemology. In chapter three then, we will uh, be looking at how Varela Thompson and Rush come to grips with the mainstream view of cognitive science as it was both at the time that the book was originally written and published and um, which perhaps sadly remains the case today, um, though perhaps also not so sadly in some ways, as we'll see. Um, so that is to say cognition as a computational process uh, that is conducted over symbolic representations. So this idea of cognition as a computational process is simple to say, um, but just how complex a statement that is, is demonstrated in many ways by the, the very many books across the gamut of disciplines in the cognitive sciences that have tried to unpack what each of those terms mean and how they relate to one another. It is uh, not in the least a, a straightforward thing to do. So while the inactive approach is most um, famously recognized as an embodied cognitive science, um, it's right there in the title of the book. Um, it is perhaps most controversial in the sense in which it is also perceived as an anti-representational approach to cognitive science. Um, so while representations, as we see in chapter three of the book, particularly symbolic representations, are fundamental to the cognitivist claim, the authors argue that it's necessary that this idea of cognition as computation over representations necessarily ruptures some kind of relationship, um, at least one, um, either between the mind and the world in which the representations intervene um, in, in mediating role or otherwise between the mind and the world, or indeed between the mind and the body. And we have a, a separation of, of different aspects of self um, which threaten certain understandings of either one or the other of those terms, or indeed um, both of those cases. The, the fundamental circularity though taken as the initial postulate of the inactive approach is thus punctured by any possibility of cognition being mediated by symbolic representations. And there we see really that the uh, some of the tension uh, arising between the two terms. I guess it, it becomes a question of, well, do we not then just become um, representational abolitionists in some way? Um, and there is a strong appeal to this radical point of view, uh, not least of which because it might turn out to be importantly correct. Um, simultaneously, we can recognize a certain tension here. The fundamental circularity ensures that we recognize ourselves as researchers in any of the cognitive scientists, sciences or elsewhere as part of the process of understanding ourselves. Uh, this kind of reflective aspect of things is what drops us into the, the hall of mirrors, as it were. And while we might resist the idea of cognition being equated with or reduced to computation over representations, it'll nevertheless be the case that we continually use and manipulate symbolic representations. Symbolic uh, symbols will appear in all of our published work and all of our means of engaging with cognitive science. Um, as a trivial example, it is simultaneously true that um, you, are, you are 
currently seeing or hearing me, Marit McGann, um, speak about cognitive science. Um, but it is also true that you are neither seeing nor hearing me because I'm in a one person room here in Limerick in Ireland and you are interacting via a whole bunch of symbols and representations and that everything about our interaction is at present mediated. And in fact, in any professional capacity in which we're engaged in cognitive science, those interactions, um, including our descriptions of what the mind is and how it works, will be mediated by representations. So there's a little bit of tension um, there. And there's, cognition may not necessarily involve representations. Uh, cognitive science certainly does. And the ways in which representations play a role in cognitive processes and the cognitive processes of cognitive science, um, and indeed any other processes in which they're involved, will ultimately need to be accounted for even within the inactive approach. Um, so this can be a, a distinctly tricky division or distinction uh, to keep consistent about. Uh, and indeed, it's only in some of the more recent developments within inactive cognitive science that we've seen this rather knotty problem really tackled in a, um, in a, a, a rich way. Uh, but that might be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Um, but it will be there, understanding or some, some grappling with this tension will be there as part of the praxis of any inactive cognitive science. But that um, is, at least brings us with the, the good news that we will be turning now to um, the work of Marika van Voigt, who is assistant professor at the University, uh, sorry, the Institute of Artificial Intelligence and Cognitive Engineering at the University of Groningen. Um, the research uh, in, in Dr. Van Vogt's lab um, focuses on uh, how the mind becomes focused and unfocused. So uh, mind wandering and meditation and the, the various cognitive operations that are um, underlying and, and involved in, in those. Um, and so she, her work uh, involves a, a whole host of research around um, me, um, analytical uh, meditation as practiced by Tibetan monks and nuns and how these affect cognition and emotion. So I'll um, shut up. Um, very quickly, so as uh, we can give as much time as possible to Marika, who I know uh, has um, limited time with us today. Um, but in, uh, and um, with that, I will invite you to explore that that tension, uh, Marika, with uh, with symbolic representations. Thank you so much, Marek, for that a wonderful and very rich introduction and uh, putting us um, back on the on the map of the rich discussions that were before. I'm sorry, I couldn't be there live. I was uh, traveling um, in India where the time difference makes it very late at night and my brain shuts down at that time. So I watched some of it on YouTube later um, and uh, very much enjoyed it. So I hope I will be able to join some of the future sessions as well. And uh, as Marek already indicated, I'm gonna have to disappear in uh, a little less than an hour from now. So uh, to take care of some um, of my own embodiment, which is ballet class. So, you know, also priorities. Um, uh, I always am a big proponent of making sure that the work-life balance is on the uh, right side. Um, so I'm going to share with you my perspective uh, of being a kind of a curious species, I guess, of somebody who does research on meditation and mind wandering, but also is a computational cognitive neuroscientist and one of the users of these models. And what I hope to accomplish is um, share with you a little bit from the inside of, you know, how does this computational modeling work and how does it relate to what's being discussed in the embodied mind? Sometimes I think the embodied mind doesn't quite get um, or the richness of the way modeling is done nowadays. I think it's also modeling has gone through quite some development. Um, so yeah, hopefully this will be helpful to enrich the discussion and really also bring the discussion into a domain of how do we um, engage with these ideas in, um, in a practical way when we are cognitive scientists. And what is the benefit? Um, uh, what are the benefits, but also the challenges of cognitive science? Um, so my main message, um, just to make sure that we get that across, is that um, computational modeling of cognition takes a reductive approach, um, but also this has the strong uh, benefit that it can make testable and falsifiable predictions. And for some other approaches that have been suggested as an alternative, like dynamical systems theory, um, I have yet to see testable and falsifiable predictions. Um, so um, at least not to not to the extent that we can see with simplified models. So what I 
um, yeah, suggest instead is an intellectual humility and really making sure that we are aware of when we are taking this kind of an approach of what are the limitations on um, on these methods. And actually, these are limitations on the one hand and um, even within the framework of Western cognitive science. But then if we take the broader view, um, this is all grounded in ideas about specific Western people. And when you do research with Tibetan Buddhist monks, you find out that a lot of the tasks and, um, and uh, methods that we use might not even apply to people that have had a very different kinds of cognitive training. So those are going to be some of the ideas I will be elaborating on. So let's uh, get into it. And by the way, I um, in my slides, uh, you will see this um, image of the embodied mind. I will try, I've tried as much as possible whenever I'm presenting my own ideas that I would um, just use other images. And whenever I'm presenting the main points of the chapter, which I also wanted to do to make sure that, you know, it would be my reaction on the on the chapter. And also, if you didn't get a chance to read the chapter, then um, you get the main points, at least. Um, then I uh, put this um, this uh, icon of the book so you can easily recognize what's the chapter and what's me. Um, so yeah, the chapter starts with the history of the cognitivist conception of the mind, which really goes back to the cybernetics era, where really the innovation was the idea that we could use math to understand the nervous system. And I actually remember um, when I was an undergrad and I was interested in the brain and in the mind, but also in computation, I was so excited when I found out that people actually used computational methods to study the mind. So this was obviously way later than the cybernetics era. But um, yeah, it, it is quite an interesting idea, I think, because math and uh, computer science are such powerful tools to um think in a structured way about things and make predictions and uh, well as you can see there are various developments in that era that really led to key idea the key idea of expressing mental processes as mathematical formulations um so then the chapter goes on to discuss uh, the the fundamental work of McCulloch and Pitts, who um, developed devices, kind of McCulloch and Pitts neuron that you can see over here. It's really obviously a highly simplified um, conception of a neuron, um, as uh, any neuroscientist knows. I mean, if you see these beautiful pictures of neurons, they are very complicated, um, beautiful creatures with tentacles that come out that, that tie into each other and have many more inputs than just three. Um, of course, you can have more complicated McCulloch and Pitt neurons, but you know these ones, they are just operating on things that are either minus ones or plus ones, and they get added, and then they get thresholded, and the output is again a minus one or a plus one. So this is a very simple binary code, um, which is much much simplified over the real um, real situation in a brain. Um, so McCulloch and Pitt started by the idea that logic is the proper discipline to understand the brain. Um, I'm not sure whether I would personally agree with that. I think it is a discipline to understand the brain, not necessarily the discipline to study the brain. Um, they also said that the brain embodies logical principles in its neurons and um, at the same time, uh, there was this commentary in the embodied mind that logic neglects the brain's distributed qualities. And I was a bit confused about this because I think also later in the chapter, they do say that symbols can be distributed uh, representations. Um, and I think logic is not necessarily um, inconsistent with um, being distributed. But yeah, that's just my little comments on here. Um, main idea next main idea is that cognition can be defined as computations on symbolic representations as Merrick already mentioned in his introduction so the idea that they came up with was that intelligence resembles computation in its essential characteristics um so this was where where these ideas were born that intelligence equals computation and, and of course, that's one of the claims that's highly debated in this um, in this chapter of the embodied minds. So then, um, in particular, there's a lot of critical appraisal in the embodied minds of symbolic models um, of cognition. And this is where I personally 
um, was quite um, uh, interested in um, seeing these claims and did not quite agree because I personally also work on symbolic models of the mind. And um, I think they are uh, very helpful tools. Um, so symbolic models, according to the embodied minds, are um, the only way we can account for intelligence. And um, sorry, they, in in the chapter, it, it says like the only way we can account for intelligence and intentionality is to hypothesize that cognition consists of acting on the basis of representations, a symbolic code constrained by semantic values. and. Here, it is also noted that a symbol can be a distributed pattern. So this is different from these McCulloch and Pitts neurons, which are much more localized. And obviously, this I initial idea that one neuron is like one piece of information is um, yeah, a little bit too, too simplified. I mean, actually, maybe as a, as a side note, um, one of the sayings I like a lot is that um, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> so, um, of course, the McCulloch and Pitts neurons are wrong. And of course, symbolic models, all symbolic models are wrong. Um, but the question is more like, are, are they useful? And to what extent are they useful? And what do they tell us? So I think that um, is an important subtlety to make um, in, or it's an important subtlety of, to appreciate um, in um, understanding comp uh, computational modeling of cognition. Um, so, for example, and this is why I want to uh, give you an example of a mo symbolic model uh, that I have created, uh, that I'm working with, and that I find actually quite useful to understand um, mind wandering, which is, um, as Marek also indicated, um, uh, one of the main topics that I'm working on. And so the model that I've been working on is the Act R cognitive architecture, um, which has been around for a while. It's actually grounded really solidly in this tradition of cognitive models. Mm. I mean, I'm citing here this um, book by Anderson from 1997, but obviously um, he developed it uh, way before then. He was actually at CMU, so one of the hotspots of the development of computational modeling of cognition, both of the uh, connectionist approaches and this more um, symbolic modeling approaches. And um, these models are highly simplified and clearly wrong, but still, I think, useful. Um, so, for example, this XR um, cognitive model uh, consists of various modules that you see here um, um, projected on a brain. And uh, it consists, for example, of models of uh, visual areas that would be processing visual stimuli of um, motor areas that would be um, able, allowing the model to you know, press buttons, just like a human uh, would be pressing buttons when interacting with a cognitive task. It has um, what's called an imaginal module, sort of like a, uh, a working memory where you can store information. It has a, a control module that mm, allows you to control a sequence of steps that you need to follow to reach a certain outcome. It has a retrieval module that's like a memory um, store. And then it has a procedural module that sort of directs all these other modules uh, together. And so this system as a whole can be then um, allowed, to, well, you can uh, use all these cognitive resources as a sort of a programming language of cognition um, to, um, formalize sort of the steps that a human would also take to solve a particular task. And then you can have both the human and the computer interact with the same task and make predictions about what the result would be, what kind of response times uh, the person would generate and what kind of responses they would give. Um, actually, one thing to note is that while this is called a symbolic model, Initially, it was also a symbolic model, but over the years, actually, these models have um, acquired also sub-symbolic components that are continuous. So they are not fully symbolic. So this is, I think, an important um, thing to appreciate that obviously at the time of the writing of the embodied minds, um, this that was either very new or not yet existent. So um, therefore, the treatment of symbolic models as just purely symbol, symbol manipulation is sort of 
um, the, the main uh, message. But nowadays, these models consist of a very, you know, interacting, symbolic, and um, more continuous or sub-symbolic components. Um, so to get to drill down a little bit more concretely in what these things are, um, let me give you an example uh, of, of how this works. So um, the ECTAR symbolic models, the symbolic part of the model basically consists of if-then rules that can interact with these cognitive resources, the visual module and the memory module and the, um, the button pressing manual module. And basically these if-then rules are something like this. Um, this is actually one of the if-then rules that I have in my mind wandering model, which is the the if then rule that says, okay, now we're going to start the thought pump, the, the pump of thoughts into our mind. And uh, when does this happen? It's when in our retrieval module, in our memory, um, we sort of get this goal that says get distracted. Um, maybe getting distracted sounds weird as a goal, but I think it's not that weird because um, getting distracted from the perspective of a psychological task is probably the same as uh, starting to think about the task of life, which is really the important stuff that we as humans do, um, which actually coincidentally maybe makes mind wandering models quite interesting from the perspective of the embodied mind, because it starts to bring in the um, outside the task situation into the model, um, you know, the rest of life, which we Normally, when we are doing cognitive science, we like to forget that a person also has a life outside these very boring and stupid tasks that we have to do. Anyway, um, so when our goal is getting distracted, then I'm actually going to set my goal module to work and say, OK, make make me distracted. And how do I get distracted? By remembering lots of items. So I'm going to retrieve some items from my memory. Um, yeah, so this is how this more or less works. Um, if you put a whole bunch of these if then rules together, um, you can predict responses and you can predict response times. Um, so that's very generally how act our symbolic models work. And this is literally, you know, what it looks like. Um, so then more specifically for a model of mind wandering, what are the basic principles? So again, this is a case of um, model is surely wrong uh, but i hope somewhat useful um, because of course it's a very simplified situation that's the whole logic of computational modeling is you're trying to see like okay if i just make these very simple assumptions what can we conclude and of course we know that's not always right but maybe it gives us some ideas of if you make these assumptions what follows so um we know that mind wandering is predominantly a memory recall process um so, and we also know that mind wandering, you could say, is in direct competition with the task. So um, in my model, actually, this is a better picture. Um, that That's what I um, sort of put together. So we have the competition between the paying attention process on the left and the thought prompt or the mind wandering process on the right. So the thought prompt does nothing more than retrieving a bunch of memories from our memory uh, store. Um, which you know one memory leads to the next in the process of associative elaboration and we keep sort of remembering different things until at some point we realize we retrieve a memory that says i'm supposed to be attending then that's supposed to be attending brings us back to the task and in the task situation you know we might be presented with various stimuli and then we interact with these stimuli we do whatever is necessary to uh, respond to these stimuli which is mostly the, the situation when we are in a psychology lab um, which is what these models are mostly um, made to describe and we keep responding to these task stimuli um, um, as long as we are have some sense of that we are attending. And so that's where I made this little attentional spotlight. Uh, so we're attending to the task stimulus. And when there's no task stimulus, we sort of have to have this kind of a metacognitive process that checks whether you're attending. However, um, when there is nothing happening, this will automatically um, grow weaker. And this is actually driven by a sub-symbolic part, sub part of the model, which will um uh, which basically is an equation that describes how all memories sort of decay in strength over time 
which is based on lots and lots of memory research that has um, come up with, you know, the equation of how quickly memories decay in time. And the weaker this um, checking process is, the more easy it is for your attention to be captured by the thought pump, and then you switch to the other side. So it's this sort of balance between the two systems that is my computational model. And I can have this computational model engage with a certain task that we use in the lab to measure mind wandering. Um, so for example, this is a very, very simple task. And uh, in this simple task, what happens is that person uh, sees um, a stimulus roughly every two seconds. And the stimulus can be either an O, um, O or a Q. Whenever there's an O, they're supposed to press a button. Whenever there's a Q, they're supposed to not press the button. So um, if, they, um, if they see a stimulus, according to my model, the first thing they have to do is to retrieve from memory a stimulus response mapping that says, okay, when there's an O, I press a button, or when there's a Q, I do not press a button. However, at some point, as I said, you know, this paying attention process, um, checking whether you're paying attention grows weaker and weaker and then the thought pump get um uh, takes over when the thought pump takes over you will still probably be able to press a button whenever there's a stimulus because that's so simple you don't even need like explicit memory retrievals for this but um you would just do your habitual response which means that um when there is a cue to which you should not respond um you will still respond and make an error um, and then at some point you will realize you are mind wandering and go back to the main task. So literally this is what I programmed into my computer model. And then I had it interact with the same task and then we get the following kind of result. So this is again, an example of what we do when we make computational models of cognition. We, um, uh, collect data where people do this kind of a task. And so you can see here that uh, people are on average 60% correct on um, this O's and Q's task, um, because although it is very simple, uh, actually this is mostly the accuracy, this is just the accuracy on the Q's, um, which is the very simple stimulus. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, the, the cues, they are the rare stimulus and where you should not respond. And because it's so habitual to respond, people will be relatively um, frequently incorrect. So therefore only 60% correct. <laughs> that in my simulation, uh, people are roughly um, um, the same amount correct. There we go. Um, we can also model the response time. And you can see again that <laughs> is roughly um, correct, so uh, uh, about 400 milliseconds. And we can also look at the variability of response time. My model is actually a little bit more variable than the responses in my empirical, um, in the empirical data, but it's still in the same ballpark. So I think this is really cool about computational models of cognition. You take some theory about how people do the task, um, of course, assuming that people are some kind of information processing machine, but in this case, also assuming that uh, people have other stuff going on than just the task. Um, and then you can make predictions about exactly how accurate they're going to be, exactly how fast they're going to be, and you can test these predictions in empirical data. And uh, <laughs> this model can also introspect um, because we can ask it, um, just like with the same frequency as in the real task is where you on the thought pump or were you um, in your focused attention uh, state and um, about 60% of the time uh, they were on task and this is the same for our model. So this is actually really cool. Um, my computer model um, can introspect in some sense. <laughs> um, and it, we can even ask it when it was uh, mind wandering. We can ask it what it was, <laughs> what kind of memories it was retrieving. Whether it, those were memories about the past or about the future or about the present. So in this way, you can see that um, you can model these kind of mind wandering processes and then also make very precise predictions about um, what you uh, 
what you think is happening. And you can even go further. Um, so I'm now very interested in this process of depressive rumination of where the mind can get stuck in a process of what you could say is maladaptive mind wandering or maladaptive daydreaming where people really just keep going in the same and narrowly focused uncontrolled repetitive thinking that's mostly negative self-referential um, is a, um, really a key factor in maintaining and instigating depression and Kalina Kristoff calls it a, a constrained form of mind wandering. So what's interesting about these computational models is that we can say, okay, uh, this is a verbal theory. How can we make this more precise? How can we turn this into the same equation? So we take the words and then we turn them into equations that allow us to make uh, predictive uh, predictions. And so what I did to model rumination is I said, okay, um, it is clearly a, a mostly negative process. So I have to increase the number of negative memories. Um, and in addition, it's once you're in a negative mood, it's difficult to get out. So um, in technical terms, I made the within valence spreading activation stronger. It just meant that um, when negative memories sort of make each other more active so that once you are retrieving a negative memory the other negative memories are more active and therefore easier to retrieve than um, non-negative memories and when you do this you just make these simple assumptions you can then make predictions for what follows from these assumptions and what we saw was that um in this uh, ruminative model, or you could say the depressed model, uh, of course, this is not like the lived experience of being depressed. It's just like one aspect of depression, which is the increased availability of negative valence information, will lead to this specific information processing deficit, a decrease in the ability um, to accurately perform this task. And there was actually, interestingly, no difference in how often the model um, was on task and also no difference in the variability of the response times. Um, and then these are uh, predictions that you can then test in follow-up um, uh, experiments. And then you can either uh, verify or falsify your model, which is, I think, a very um, strong uh, feature of this kind of an approach. Um, we can even apply the model in different kind of task situations. So we also use the same kind of formalization to predict performance on a very complex task that involves positive faces and negative faces and neutral faces. And it turned out that people um, suffering from depression had this very specific inability to remove negative um, information, uh, as in faces with sort of um, um, fearful and angry expressions from their memory, but they had no problems with any of the other faces. So, I mean, I'm not going to explain to you um, the very, you know, detailed pattern of these, of these graphs. Um, but basically, the point I want to make is that in this graph, you see um, in darker colors, the data, so control data and the press data, and in lighter colors, the model. And you can see that with these very simple assumptions about differences between depressed and healthy individuals, we could explain a very, um, very complicated and detailed pattern of results. Um, and I think that's, again, something that you can do with these computational models that you would not be able to do when you just have verbal models, because, you know, it's not possible, I think, for the human mind. Um, maybe if you have a very special mind, it is. But for most people, it would not be possible to think through all these very specific conditions and simulate them for a long enough time to make such detailed predictions. <clears throat> so some observations from you know, this computational modeling of cognition approach. Um, one interesting bit that I already mentioned is that the dynamics of mind wandering is actually driven by the sub-symbolic part of the model. Um, so even current computational models of cognition are not fully symbolic. They are interacting parts of symbolic and sub-symbolic parts of the model. So <clears throat> the claim that um, this um, 
the cognitive science is only focused on symbol manipulation, I think is uh, was maybe true at that time, but nowadays actually it has evolved. <laughs> and I think this was really important because it allowed us to predict the dynamics of mind wandering in this specific um, uh, case. And also the model can introspect in some sense. And of course it can introspect because we modeled not only performing the tasks, but also the non-task part and i think this is where maybe we go a little bit beyond the classical cognitive science and that there was also definitely at the time of the embodied mind that was not existing this idea that you could study mind wandering and sort of bring the outside cognitive task into the lab situation it's of course a still a highly simplified way of bringing the outside of the lab into the lab but it is a controlled way that you can still get the benefits of the very specific predictions um, while expanding a little bit your scope of what you're studying. Um, and as I also emphasized several times is this model can make quantitative predictions. And of course, it is true that not all behavior that uh, or mental processes that we might be interested in can be captured with models. And one uh, clear example here is that I've also created a computational model of meditation, which I've you know done fairly successfully for focused attention meditation. But when I'm thinking about open monitoring meditation, which gets into the more non-dual perspectives that we um, that were also discussed in the last session of the of this uh, core and action program. I wouldn't really know how to fit that into um, the um, into the co computational models of cognition. So I, that doesn't mean these other things don't exist, but it's just that the you know these models are made to work for specific situations, and the business of modeling is really to create precise and testable predictions. Um, and if if you can't do that, then the model is unfalsifiable, which then doesn't make it very useful. So, um, so that was my little explanation of maybe the inside of what it's like to be a computational modeler of cognition. So now we go back to the embodied minds and some points they, they make um, because they um, continue to um, describe the cognitivist research program which really um, considers cognition as information process, uh, is information processing as symbolic computation. And I already um, mentioned that, well, I don't fully agree. I think um, in at least the current version of cognitive science, um, uh, it's more than just symbolic computation. And also therefore um, cognition doesn't necessarily work through any device that can support symbol manipulation and actually, um, one thing I didn't put in my slides, but um, uh, quite a few of my colleagues are working um, in a center called Cognigron, where um, material scientists are collaborating with computational modelers of cognition to really use this more analog computing um, impl implemented in different kinds of materials than the silicon that is usually used in a computer um to sort of simulate these uh, cognitive processes so i think nowadays these approaches of symbolic and non-symbolic analog um, are much more um rubbing um maybe is a nice word to to use here um and also in the in the embodied mind it said that the cognitive system is working adequately when symbols appropriately represent some aspect of the world and the information processing leads to successful solution of the problem given to the system. I And this is one part where I do fully agree, um, because as I showed you in my model, the logic of computational modeling of cognition is you basically, you actually, um, you think of how, how people are solving particular cognitive tasks, then you put a model together that formalizes that, and then you um, you expose it to the same task as the human, and then you compare the outputs of the model to the outputs of the human and um, see whether they produce the same behavior. If they don't, then you go back to the drawing board and make your um, um, adapt your computational model of cognition. Um, 
there's also a comment in the chat. Okay, question. Um, would you be able to specify exactly what the sub-symbolic part of the model is? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so really, this is a set of equations that are continuously working in the background and that describe things like, well, most notably, um, the activations of different memories, so how strong they are. And, and in the logic of this model, um, memories can only be retrieved when they are strong, then they are active enough. So these are th sort of dynamical things that are you know, changing in their activation over time. Whenever a memory gets retrieved, it gets its activation gets bumped up and then it decays over time. So yeah, those are, uh, that's the sub-symbolic part. Does that help? Uh, more or less, okay. Yeah, and there are some other continuous variables as well that are playing in the background, uh, but that are not symbolic. Um, well, or at least, yeah. Another question by Chris, how would you relate the sub-symbolic processes to syntax as it is presented in the embodied mind? Hmm. I'm not sure. Actually, I don't really um, remember very detailed how syntax is represented, pre presented in the embodied mind. So maybe you can put it in the Slack and I will uh, get back to it uh, after the session. <laughs> or maybe somebody else has an idea. <laughs> cool. So um, let's move on to uh, the talk. I think now actually I have though said most of the uh, important stuff. So I will now continue to review the chapter and then hopefully have um, some time to also um, answer more questions. So um, the chapter goes on to say like, where does cognitivism manifest? And it highlights a couple of fields. And actually I think this is also really interesting to look at. Um, um, because obviously a lot has happened in, in a lot of these fields, especially artificial intelligence and then neuroscience, also a lot has happened, psychology, psychoanalysis, um, and especially the artificial intelligence. I have something to say about, of course, working in the Bernoulli Institute of uh, Mathematics, Computer Science and AI. Um, so um, according to the embodied mind, artificial intelligence is the literal construal of the cognitivist hypothesis. And they also write like a cognitive device capable of understanding human language and of writing its own programs when presented with a task by an untrained user um, would be, um, um, or that that is artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, I was thinking, well, this chat GPT that now everybody is talking about is really something like that, although actually that's, more the non-symbolic AI because it really has learned from patterns of behavior, but we don't know what the symbols are. Um, I mean, there, there is no specific algorithms being implemented in this, um, in this system. It's literally just taking a whole bunch of data and then extract the patterns out of that. That is chat GPT. And yet it appears as a cognitive device capable of understanding human language and of writing, well, literally also writing its own program. Well, at least writing programs. I'm not sure whether it's writing its own programs, probably not, but it can write programs when presented with a task by an untrained user. I mean, this really um, um, freaks out my colleagues who are uh, tr uh, teaching programming to undergrads because nowadays the undergrads can you know, um, uh, give the programming task to chat GPT and, and get do the assignment that way instead of writing the program themselves. Um, anyway, so this is, but that's of course a very recent development in AI. Um, the other thing that's written in this develop, you know, in how um, cognitivism manifests in artificial intelligence is that cognitive representations are said to be about something for the system in that sense, intentional, and this was again something that I wasn't sure whether I was agreeing with. Um, yeah, whether the intentionality of AI, I'm not sure whether everyone that works on AI really believes anything about the intentionality of the AI. I think actually these discussions about intentionality of the AI are something sometimes overestimating what AI can do because even things that are um look as powerful as chat gpt 
they are pretty stupid and, and for some tasks they really when you see what it's coming up with it's incredibly stupid and doesn't seem to have any sense of what it's doing it's just that it can appear as something that's conscious and that's why some people yeah people tend to refer to it also as a you know it as a conscious system but um it really is just a pattern generator a fancy one so anyway that i think we'll probably have lots of fun discussing this in the discussion section um and um Actually, the next question is kind of nicely jibing into the neurobiology. Um, uh, so Jose asks, like, nice that you can make predictions at the behavioral se se um, level, but can you make predictions about neurobiology? Um, can you give an example for your model? Um, because maybe there are many algorithms that could produce a behavioral task, but there might be many neural implementations. That's an um, excellent question, Jose. And, in the, in the case of this mind wandering model, I haven't made um, such kind of neural predictions, but actually the reason that this act our cognitive model um, picture that I showed you had modules um, located in different parts of the brain is that you can actually then have the model make predictions for bold uh, time series, fMRI bold time series that you can then compare to what is happening in a human's brain. I myself have also done a little bit of work on um, creating something similar for EEG, but this is much more sort of in the baby stage. So I wouldn't um, take it too seriously, but yes, I would say definitely um, comparing it to, um, <coughs> sorry, neural data is, is one of the very um, useful ways to um, delineate between different possible um, model implementations of cognitive processes. <laughs> okay, so actually what was a very amusing as well was that um, what the embodied mind talked about in terms of where cognitivism manifests was in the idea of the uh, grandmother cell and uh, that was a, a hype maybe about 10 years ago in uh, cognitive neuroscience where actually they found a single unit in a human brain. So this is uh, data from human brains where they found specific cells that were um, uh, responsive to specific concepts. So this is the Jennifer Aniston cell, which is sensitive to all kinds of different pictures of Jennifer Aniston that look very different. And yet <coughs> this one cell responds to it, but doesn't respond to other humans that on the surface might look very similar. Um, so this led to the idea as the, of the brain as an information processing device and the representation in this extreme form was this grandmother cell idea. So clearly that is around and there is evidence for that, but we also now know that such cells are very rare and I'm not sure how much um, power they really have in the human brain given that we literally have like millions if not billions of cells so how would the brain sort of find the right cells to respond to when it has so many cells so i would say that some people spend their career on finding particular types of cells but most people now or a lot of people now think really more about the brain in terms of much more distributed patterns um, um yeah not single cells like having the uh having all the power um and then um finally in psychology i'm, I'm not going to talk about psychoanalysis because i'm not enough of an expert on that one um but in psychology um it definitely i would say is true that it relies heavily on the computer metaphor especially in this experimental psychology domain that i would say i'm also part of and um, a big problem that I um, encounter when I do research on meditation and um, mind wandering is that introspection has this stigma of being seen as unreliable. And um, I think this is where this research on mind wandering was um, a very interesting innovation because I can see why introspection in general was considered to be unreliable since if you're asking um, a naive person, um, about their experiences in the past hour, which was, you know, what some of these studies did, then obviously they are going to get pretty crappy data because we're pretty bad at remembering what happens in an hour. And so much happens in our mind when 
um, in an hour. And we're also, most of us don't have too much experience in observing our own minds. But the innovation in mind wandering research was the inclusion of thought probes in cognitive tasks. So you put a person in a lab in a boring task most of the time, although it works in basically any task I've tried at least. And then every so often you just ask them, what are you thinking about just now? And then you make a question that is answerable to a lot of people. Um, and this allows you to then combine subjective experience like you can ask them the question, the, you can give them multiple choice options. This is most often what we do. Like, were you thinking about um, the task, your performance on the task, um, maybe some sensations in your body, some external sounds or so on. And then you can relate these um, subjective uh, thought states with objective data like response times and accuracy. And this is what you know the model was trying to explain that I showed to you earlier. Um, and this um, can solve the uh, unreliability problem to some extent because it's just about right now. And of course, um, and, and this has been more effective, I think, because we can see clear relationships between brain and behavior. Having said that, we still have some way to go um, because I think still um, um, there is some noise in, in what kind of responses people give. So I think here a cross fertilization with approaches such as microphenomenology, which I think will be uh, discussed also later in, in the book, um, or well, surely in this, um, in this lecture series, um, can really help us to get better and better ideas about subjective experience and also really training people in observing their mind would have a good, um, 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 would really um, benefit this kind of research. Um, and then I got completely, so this is, um, yeah, just how, where cognitive vision manifests. And then the final bit of the book um, where I got quite puzzled was um, cognitivism postulates mental processes of which we cannot be aware. And then I was like, I'm not sure why this is the case. And I don't think it does. I think maybe to some extent we are um, not always aware of all mental processes, but actually um, these kind of computational models of cognition that I mentioned that I gave an example with, they're really generated from um, cognitive scientists sitting there observing their mental processes and then trying to come up with a computer program that replicates their experience. And they really spend a lot of time thinking about the same task. So um, although they might not have been trained in microphenomenology or anything like that, formally, I mean, I think a lot of um, uh, this observation of mental processes is going on. So there must be awareness, otherwise you wouldn't be able to turn it into computer code. Um, so yeah, and then also I wasn't quite sure of the cognitivism embraces the idea the self is fragmented. Um, yeah, and so I, I had some questions uh, about that. So I really, you know, think that our computational models of cognition are largely based on introspection. Um, and then the final point they make is cognitive processes are modular and I that would be the part here that I would agree with. Um, um, so that's also what I showed you in this symbolic model that I presented. Maybe I'm going to skip this and um, in the interest of time, uh, really go to my sort of the end point. So I still have a little bit of time for answering questions, which is where does this leave the cognitive modeler? Um, so I would say that on the one hand, the conceptions of AI in the embodied mind are a little bit old fashioned. So currently the AI, like um, a lot of the models that we see in our everyday life are mostly non-symbolic and the models of cognition um, are a combination of symbolic and sub-symbolic models. Um, in this, um, in the sort of an active community. I think there's been a lot of interest in alternative models that are called dynamical systems. I would say they're interesting, but I very much struggle to see concrete and falsifiable predictions. Maybe I've missed something, but um, yeah, this is my struggle with that. 
Um, and the other important thing is that I would say that models of cognition actually do rely a lot on subjective experience to be created. So also, I don't think they assume that cognition is unaware because otherwise you could not come up with these models. Um, and I would also say that um, measurement um, remains a challenge because Subjective experience in all its richness is very hard to measure. So of course there's microphenomenology, but this doesn't really work um, if you want to um, understand. That, that, I mean, it, 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 it zooms into a very minute aspect of experience. If you want to look at performance over the course of an hour of a task, it's just like not feasible. Um, so I think mind wandering research is a very interesting um, um, approach that sort of combines some of the subjective experience with some of the more objective task performance aspects that are also very valuable because you can make these um, precise and falsifiable predictions. Um, and I would also say um, methods of microphenomenology are still very hard to publish these days. Um, okay, then let's skip the part about the sense of the self. Um, because I want to move to then um, one sort of final point I wanted to make, which harps back on my research with Tibetan Buddhist monks, which is that, um, you know, these models of cognition, um, information processing, I think they are doing a pretty decent job at explaining how humans interact with cognitive tasks. But um, interaction with cognitive tasks works in a certain way for minds that have been trained in a certain way like in our western education system when you give the same kind of task to um, other people like a tibetan monks that have had a very different kind of education system and mental training then uh, they can understand how they're supposed to do the task but their mental habits are very different and this means that the kind of response times and accuracies you get are very different from what you get in Western, um, Western minds, so to speak, or Western trained minds. Um, so although these kind of tasks claim to measure cognition in a very, um, um, very cultural agnostic way, I don't think they do. And uh, yeah, this is, of course, um, this means that when we draw conclusions, we should be aware that maybe the conclusions are not as universally uh, uh, applicable as we'd like them to be. So in summary, um, the chapter in my reading laid out the history of cognitivism. It focused strongly on symbolic AI, but nowadays there's a lot more non-symbolic AI and um, that also combines this more sort of, um, um, well, yeah, so it, 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 it it's not just acting on symbolic representations. In fact, it's um, and getting, gaining a lot of its power from the non-symbolic parts of it. Um, at the same time, I still see a lot of value in cognitive science. Um, it really can um, create testable hypotheses and um, um, falsifiable theories. Um, but I think the embodied mind is a useful reminder to not forget about subjective experience and also to not uh, to re a good reminder to be humble in the conclusions we draw from these experiments because they are obviously in very constrained situations where um, uh, which work which are mostly I guess applicable to people that have been trained in a certain way and that then interact with the computer task in certain ways which might not generalize to the rest of the world. So those were some of the points I wanted to make. And then I'm going to check in the chat because I think there's some more questions that have come up. Um, OK. Um, Hans is asking, when will we be able to model the solution to the hard problem of consciousness as proposed to neurophenomenology? I don't know. I'm not sure whether it would be modelable, if that's a word. <laughs> I would definitely say that um, maybe you can make baby steps towards it. So modeling um, maybe um, aspects of the hard problem. So one of the things, for example, that I'm interested in in mind wandering is to, to uh, think about the stickiness dimension of thought. So this is a very subjective dimension of our thoughts.
and um, it, it's more related to the experience than to something like, I guess, well, symbolic about the thought. So anyway. Um, and then Murilo says, um, we should not confuse the notion of intentionality um, with the idea that an agent has intentions. Oh, thank you so much, Murilo. So yeah, I, I'm not a philosopher, so I guess I'm slightly oblivious to these nuances. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, and then Atul says, regarding the point that cognitivism postulates mental processes of which we cannot um, be aware, I'm not sure, but I think they mean subpersonal mental processes. Mm. Maybe comparable to sub-symbolic equations in the model. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. But I, I would say even in, in the sub-symbolic parts of the model, they are to some extent also driven by introspection um, that, you know, this feeling of fading of memory strength. Uh, so I would say that there is some awareness at least of that. Um, And then Murillo also says, is there any computational model that can be said to be entirely symbolic? Probably not, so yeah. But I would say that from what I understand, there used to be more fully symbolic models, but now nowadays it's really a combination of symbolic and sub-symbolic models. Cool. And then I think there is a nice hand um, by, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Zhao. Um, <laughs> Please correct me when I'm very wrong. <laughs> Sorry. No problem, man. I already get, got used to it. But um, one thing that I was, first of all, thank you about your presentation, because I, I think helps us to understand why Varela put so many emphasis in the circularity. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is another text um, that I discovered in, in the podcast, podcast with Ana Varela, that uh, Varela emphasized that epistemics matter. And I think uh, we, are, we, are calling, we are talking about two different levels of problems. Like, uh, I, as I understand what you are saying to us, to understand process, a uh, compute computational modeling is still very useful and i yep. think that is something about what varela is talking about third person observation mm -hmm. in our yep. in a way that you have to produce data that can be falsible that can be able to contrast the personal experience and the, even not to trust in personal experience, like the example that you did in, in first mm -hmm. person is not exactly what Varela is saying. That, mm -hmm. that is exactly why he's talking about someone who has to be trained to do the reduction process, no? Right. And uh, because to me, all of that to, to say, because um, I think the 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 usual critics about computational modeling is not what is able to explain in a specific process, but how when you when you try to to get out of this specific problem and uh, to explain human mind mm -hmm. as a philosophical problem, yeah. you get the same reduction that uh, that appeared uh, that is useful to produce data uh, has a, an, ep an, an epistemic problem associated with that. And I think uh, what what Varel is also trying to talk in this chapter is that it's not that is not able to get data mm -hmm. and the useful data that can be in a circularity model be useful, but what concept of mind underlies uh, a narrow computer computation compu this thing yeah. <laughs> modeling yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, modeling uh, that uh, is usually that that uh, that at this time 
was being presented. I think it's a more, I think it's an epistemic okay. mo problem. Most, most of everything. Thank you for that, Joe. I'm, I'm just, I'm very aware that uh, Marika has to run off very, very quickly. So, um, I don't know if you, if you're able to, or would like to say something very quickly in response to that, or. Yeah, I, I will say a, a few sentences and then I will indeed disappear. Thank you so much, Mark. So, yeah, um, what I, I would say is I think we're probably on the same page and, and, um, I, I think the issue is probably mostly that what kind of conclusions you draw from the models, whether you realize that the models are just a model and mm -hmm. therefore wrong, but useful, but not explaining the full richness of reality or whether you believe that the models are everything there is to be uh, known and understood. So I think that's um, at least that's how I um, a little bit interpret this, um, this thing. But yeah, I'm uh, looking for, I will be happy to answer more questions on the chat. And I'm also going to watch later uh, what you guys discuss um, um, after this. Um, but yeah, I have to run off. And uh, thanks so much for coming. And I hope you'll have a really nice uh, discussion following this. Maybe even better because I'm not there. So you guys can really uh, dig in. <laughs> so um, see Thank you, you so uh, much. next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you, Marika. Bye-bye. Um, so thank you to uh, Marika. And as Marika heads away to address some immediate embodied concerns, I suggest we do the same. We can take a, a five-minute break uh, to dehydrate and or rehydrate, depending on your need, uh, or caffeinate and so on. So it's eight minutes past the hour where I am if we aim to be sort of back up and running by, by 13 minutes past the hour or thereabouts. We'll... Uh, We'll kick off the discussion and we'll be polite um, while Marika's not here. Um, so how about that? So we'll see you all in five minutes.
Hello and welcome back everybody. Give people a couple of moments there to plug back in as it were. So we can kick things off with the discussion. There's a, a few comments in the chat and uh, there was one or two people had their hand up just before um, Marika had to head off there. So I, clearly I think there, there isn't anyone here who will be able to address specific questions relating to the parameters or variables of the, uh, the, the ACT-R model that Marika's research is grounded in, but there, I think there's a huge amount of scope for looking at the, the value of different kinds of modeling and to raise some of the questions and some of the issues for, in fact, that are already coming up in the text chat around the, the potential for different styles of modeling as well. So um, Marika mentioned that while dynamical systems models have been Sort of flagged as a potentially valid way forward that for a number of, of aspects of inactive thinking it's not a, a an aspect of that kind of research work that she's personally familiar with but i re recognize that there is some uh, expertise and experience with those kinds of models in the in the zoom room as it were so it would be great to hear from people with that kind of experience too um so would anyone like to kick things off is there a a burning observation that someone wants to articulate or um, if someone has a, an unanswered question that they, they want to make sure to, to throw out there. Uh, I might just make a comment or maybe more of a query or a question. I don't know what exactly it is. It's probably a bit vague as you have said to go ahead and do. We absolutely. <laughs> um, but um, it, it's in relation to, I guess, the wording of symbolic and non-symbolic and I understand that the symbolic AI I guess I feel like it's more related to these hard-coded expert systems that were rule-based systems that had you know a very specific sequence of logical statements that one could then have to you know produce the output from and that's obviously very hard to hard code that amount of stuff into any system to really make it functional but they, they were particularly useful in some cases and the non-symbolic is being referred to as uh I guess the modern neural networks and machine learning and deep learning where there's not anything hard coded specifically into it and they're producing all of these calculations by themselves and then you have a probability distribution and it's kind of not hard coded in, in the same way but I, I find it I don't know the terminology to me seems a bit interesting or maybe confusing in light of the discussion around the kind of philosophical premise of things being representations or symbolic because I mean, as far as I can make out, mathematics itself is a heavily symbolic system that we use all of the time to manipulate symbols. And so the, even when we're saying non-symbolic, I mean, these neural networks are symbolic. Uh, they're different type of symbolic systems, but I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm finding it hard to see how they're not because they're literally a bunch of calculus and linear algebra jammed together that produce a bunch of numbers um at a very basic <laughs> level so yeah i just i guess i would be interested in hearing other people's perspectives on that particular premise or something using on it thank you um that's a, an excellent observation and i think it is one that is representative of the time at which the book was written and then the subsequent developments in the cognitive sciences since so i'll be very interested if, if you'd like to respond to that. Um, if anyone else would like to respond to that, the um, please, Atul, by our head there. Yeah. Well, I actually had a similar question and I think it's interesting the way you raised it because I actually had the opposite intuition, which is that um, AI systems, the ones we call symbolic and also the, one, the modern ones we call non-symbolic are both for themselves non-symbolic. They're physical machines and it's only for us who interpret their workings that they become symbolic or non-symbolic. So how I interpreted it, AI by itself isn't symbolic at all. It's for us who make sense of it that they acquire a symbolical structure. Uh, but so I thought it was really interesting that you made kind of the inverse point that uh, the ones we call non-symbolic are actually still in fact symbolic. But I'm not an expert in AI, so I would love to hear from someone 
maybe better versed in AI that can provide some uh, insight on this. Yeah, I mean, it's a that's a very nice point, point, and I think an important one. It, it's something that we noted uh, before. I think that this the the discussion around what is termed emergence in the book and is generally a discussion of connectionist modeling uh, across the board in cognitive science at the time is probably the aspect of the book that has dated most significantly um, in precisely for, for the kinds of reasons that have already been sort of a, a attested to by Marika uh, as well, that they, what was then this kind of strange, freshly developing um, newly emerging technology of connectionist means of processing information has um, sedimented into what is now mainstream machine learning. And what was the, the concept of artificial intelligence in the late 1980s is now entirely different to what is now considered um, the field of artificial intelligence, which has you know, merged with, and um, I mean, the term itself has become such a branding buzzword. Um, it has no fixed uh, as, uh, nor does any word, of course, but uh, in particular, you know, there's no fixed meaning here that we it, that is disciplined in in a sort of particular ways. And so there is a that notion of symbolic and sub-symbolic really, uh, I think, uh, has has a sort of implication in, and just as Atul said, in precisely the way that we interpret different tokens of the system itself. That once we analyze the system into particular kinds of components what aspects of those components do we think are uh, carrying meaning for either the system itself or for us as interpreters of the system. And for non-symbolic um, systems, there is essentially no meaning in the system um, that is discrete um, above the level of the kinds of computations that the computer is implementing. Uh, that essentially the the there aren't tokens of the kinds, for example, that Marika uh, referred to repeatedly, this idea of retrieving a memory. And um, there's not going to be a discrete um, element, token in the system that you could say, right, this is that memory that means, um, that refers to this specific event or, or that specific object and so on. So the kinds of ways in which you uh, perform processing on that, those tokens that the computation over those representations are very different kinds of processes. Um, I mean, it was a massive civil war within cognitive science in the late 1980s and early 90s. Um, the way in which it has become um, sort of metabolized, as it were, by symbolic thinking, and uh, subsequently since I think is probably, uh, give, it sort of has a lot to teach us about how difficult it is to unseat certain kinds of intuitions about what must be happening. And um, so we can you know, quite happily just change all of the description about how it works, so long as we keep our general overriding description of what is happening. Um, that, but I, I sort of, uh, it's not a, a domain in which I have, I've done a sort of a huge, huge amount of work or pro can properly understand the, the technical details, but it is a, uh, I think hopefully at least that'll give the broad outlines of, of the kinds of distinctions, the taxonomy that we're dealing with here in terms of the symbolic versus the, the non-symbolic. Um, so I'll have a sort of quick check through the chat now again, throw up your hand if you want to um, raise a particular point as well at any given time. Um, so there was some discussion about the, there's some mention of, of dynamic systems. And again, I'd, I'd love to hear from uh, any of you have some kind of experience working in these areas. It is interesting to see there that uh, the division of different aspects of the cognitive sciences can be quite stark. So there are quite a few dynamical systems uh, domains of research out there that do indeed make quite explicit and um, falsifiable numerical predictions, uh, though they tend to be in, in terms of ranges and so on. So it's interesting to see the extent to which um, the, there is sort of different perceptions of those kinds of um, uh, those kinds of models by researchers working in different fields. Uh, there's often a, a, a division, though, in, in the kinds of fields that these types of uh, work are done. So, for example, so, so someone has mentioned uh, Nadav has mentioned the role of of in, um, empirical or dynamic systems work um, there. I don't know if you want to articulate that or, or voice that um, or describe it in a little bit more depth. 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, I worked um, in my PhD in, in computational neuroscience using dynamical systems to model behavior. Um, one of my projects was actually modeling a result from a 2007 paper by Helene Slachter and uh, Antoine Lutz about uh, the effects of meditation on the attentional blink. And we uh, described attentional resources in terms of a, um, of a dynamical system which has noise in it. So noise represents the mind wandering or mental noise and the, the activity of the system represents the amount of, of attentional resources that are allocated to incoming uh, stimuli. And we showed that uh, such, such a dynamical system model can explain the, the empirical findings from this previous uh, paper about uh, uh, reduction of the attentional blink. The attentional blink is this effect where when two stimuli are shown in very quickly one after the other. So the second one tends to be um, um, not, not uh, tends to be ignored or, or doesn't gain access to, to awareness. And uh, we showed that in terms of a dynamical system representing attentional resources, how, how, it, how its activity changes over time uh, can, be, can be used to, to explain these empirical findings. Um, and more, more broadly, I, I think that dynamical systems are becoming more and more popular today as tools for modeling behavior, not necessarily cognition, although there, there are also some, some works in that regard. So reinforcement learning is a big field now, which uses a fundamental um, language of, of uh, dynamical systems, you, you could say that. Uh, uh, and and these are used to to describe uh, both behavior as well as cognitive processes. Um, so I think I think the dynamical systems under different names and, and guises are becoming uh, quite uh, quite common today in in computational cognitive science. Mm. And of course, what constitutes a, whether you're modeling behavior or cognition or um, neural processes, um, if it, whether it constitutes a cognitive model will of course depend on what your definition of cognition is. And it's, it would be interesting to try and tease apart then insofar as, so, um, I can't remember who it was, raised the, the question in the chat again, uh, feel free to, to jump in at any point, but uh, when it comes to, once you move away from the definition of cognition as computation over representations to include within cognition sub-symbolic um, aspects of processing, which may or may not be, or you know, which may be representational, but not symbolic representational. Once you've shifted your definition, um, it becomes a question then of course is, well, what are we going to replace that definition with? Once we have, um, what, what view of cognition are we replacing it with? Is it just computation over all kinds of representations? So is that um, essentially we just broaden our definition of representation there? Um, or is it something other than computation over representations, but that both symbolic and, and sub-symbolic or non-symbolic aspects of information processing are all going on? And it's these kinds of issues, of course, will affect they affect philosophical aspects of the question, but they will also affect how we then go about interpreting the model. And I think it's a, an important characteristic of model building that uh, Marika um, referred to is this, the discipline of interpreting the variables that you, you know, the, the values that you have, and then how you fit those back. Um, so you develop a, a model, that model is specified through a number of variables, each of those variables has a, a theoretical weight associated with it. It, it's, it. It's a variable in the model because the theory says cognition has this aspect to it or that aspect to it or in, um, has certain kinds of influence on certain aspects of the world. 
Um, and there's a that feedback mechanism between developing the model and testing it against empirical data is uh, a crucially disciplined one in which you have to develop your theory without just it turning into a, a model fitting exercise. Um, and the extent to which you specify precisely what your target behaviors or um, your, your, your target phenomena are and how they relate to the model um, that you've built or that you're preparing on the basis of it is a sort of a, a crucial aspect that needs to be um, carefully reflected on. And I think um, sort of Marika got at, at that aspect of the importance of the, the reflective um, practitioner of the cognitive model as a, a, a sort of a, an important theme. One as well that feeds back into our notion of, uh, as she mentioned at the end, the humility in drawing our conclusions, the sort of recognition that the model that we've produced is a product of uh, our own experiences and also our own sort of perceptions or um, recognitions of what the phenomena in question are and will, as is the nature of any scientific enterprise, be up for revision on the basis of you know, running up against different kinds of evidence. So in the just the, that last interest, you know, that fascinating slide where she noted that the, the very basic fundamental cognitive processes that were being demonstrated by her Tibetan monk participants seemed to be different in crucial ways to the Western participants, or what I assume were the Western participants in uh, some of the other experiments. And for uh, kind of a, a traditional mainstream cognitive psychological approach, that's quite a radical implication. And the, the, the ramifications of that, that there are the, the very foundational processes which govern psychology are either contextual or dependent on upbringing or professional training and so on, that they are malleable um, is a, a kind of a quite a radical and dangerous perspective. And it will be really interesting to see how this sort of feeds back then into, as Marie said itself, you have to go away and change your model then. You have to um, refine your model, but you have at least a, a productive process therein. Um, so the, it, the, I think what makes the inactive approach, or, and this has come up in, I think, previous discussions and has come up in the Slack a little bit as well, which is, well, what does a, an, an active approach to this look like practically? Um, and it has that, I think, the uh, a reflective process um, that it means that, I, you know, that there are no sacred cows, as it were, for um, for cognition. There's there's nothing that we will um, be willing to sort of fix and say this is the um, this is a, a fundamental aspect of the cognitive system and we will not allow it to budge. Uh, everything else will be reinterpreted in, in those um, terms. When we deal with an experience or we deal with um, empirical data that suggests that there is variability here, that maybe things aren't as determinate as they um, seemed in the, um, the past, then you know, we, we can run with that too. I hope I'm making some kind of sense here. I'm talking for an awfully long time. So certainly please somebody interrupt me and or throw some kind of comment in the chat for the, the love of all that is good. So I, I guess, if, is there anything about sort of aspects of this or indeed just in your reading of the chapter, right? So we're here to discuss chapter three. If there are some aspects of chapter three that kind of stuck in your mind and haven't come up for discussion yet, then again, sort of throw out any half-formed uh, quasi-articulate queries that you might have. Yes, on you. So I'm thinking like, I don't know if I get this correctly, um, but I feel like computational modeling would necessarily be operating from like a representationalist framework. Um, and then the inactivist project would be more radical than that because it would be saying like, uh, we're not really representing, but we're like enacting a reality in an autonomous way. So would it be possible to account for that? Like what, what would be some of the 
possibility in computation modeling, if any, that would allow you to account for that. So I, I, I think that's a really, it's a really good and an important question. And it gets back to that notion, I think, that um, what I, as I said earlier, it depends on what you call cognition. Uh, so there is a, the notion of, or the, or the, one of the ostensive differences between artificial intelligence on the one hand, or the original premise of the discipline of artificial intelligence on the one hand, and the idea of cognitive modeling on the other, was that artificial intelligence is a sort of very ambitious attempt, and it actually remains the um, intention and, and ambitions of some of the, the significant private organizations that we're, we're seeing in the news recently, to actually produce a thing that is intelligent, that has real intelligence for whatever uh, we might consider intelligence to be. Cognitive modeling, on the other hand, is an effort to just develop disciplined formal computational models of cognitive processes. But of course, that will entirely depend on what you consider to be a cognitive process. Insofar as there's lots of cognitive modeling, as it were, within the inactive literature, but it is arising from the field that we would um, more frequently describe as artificial life. And in this case, we're using the tools of computational systems in order to model key um, processes or aspects that we think are relevant to uh, life and, and living sense making and, and that kind of thing. So there is certainly a place for computational modeling within an active research, but it can't ever have at least, uh, that's a very strong phrase. I'm gonna sort of walk that one back a little bit. Um, it certainly does not have currently the ambition of the kind of uh, production of a, a genuinely, you know, a, an actual cognitive system. It's much more like um, saying, well, we can understand the weather by building models of the atmosphere, computational models of the atmosphere, and we can make certain kinds of predictions and draw certain kinds of conclusions about how the atmosphere works because we have built these computational models. Um, similarly, we can look at cognition in whatever definition of cognition you might like to talk about, whether it's certain kinds of behavior, whether it's neural um, activity of various different kinds. And we can develop computational models of those processes without taking the extra step to say, this is a thinking thing, or this is a, a cognitive system of the right kind of thing. And so the, the tools, become a means of us to, uh, for us to test um, and sort of check or discipline our thinking about certain kinds of processes um, without that sort of uh, that, that kind of more ambitious extra uh, extra step. And so there is already within what would be considered an active literature and indeed within the, the embodied mind itself, there's reference to um, the, the um, cellular automata um, and uh, other similar fundamental artificial life systems, um, which go back even sort of prior to. So we it touched on in, in some of the work from the, um, we, we see in the talks or is, is available in the talks from the previous semester too. Um, so there is, there's definitely scope for, and indeed lots of use of computational models. It's just done with even more of the kind of humility that Marika was talking about, I think. Does that answer the question there? Does anyone else want to come in on that? Can I can I ask just a follow up on that? Of course. Um, so, I, so I don't know if I'm understanding you correctly, but there's like a distinction between, like, let's say you're using computational modeling, and then you can simulate for cognition, but then that would be different from like creating intelligence or like actually creating something that's like conscious or, or intelligent, um, and that would be related to whether you're creating like let's say, I don't know, like artificial life or like that and how that's like different from conventional AI that we think of. But like, what would be the difference? Like you mentioned like cellular automaton, right? But that wouldn't be artificial life because like, like would that include like, like creating something that's like metabolic, like it includes biological processes or can you implement it in something that's completely just like physical system? Or can you do that like in, in just like information integration? Because there are like theories, like integrated, 
uh, information theory that would say, like, maybe you don't really need life for that, for a system to become like, conscious. Um, yes, no, that's a that's a um, a good point. So the as uh, I think again, we'll sort of come out more over the course of the development of the chapters. And um, I'm I think if you have a look at Evan Thompson's talk from last semester, there's a, a really good unpacking of this in a, a um, uh, in, you know in his characteristically very clear manner. The role of autonomy and subsequently um, autonomy, adaptive autonomy specifically, um, is vitally important here. So insofar as a computational system does not demonstrate the kind of adaptive autonomy that is required to have a, a particular perspective um, or an owned perspective on the world, then it's it, all it ever is is, is kind of a, a simulation in the same way that you know we might have a an atmospheric simulation. I, I can simulate the atmosphere, but I'll never claim that I've weather in my computer. Um, so similarly, I can I can simulate certain processes. I think these are crucial processes for cognition because of the theory of cognition that I have. But the processes themselves are not cognitive processes. Uh, the, you know, the simulation isn't, isn't a cognitive one because it doesn't it, it is not grounded in or animated by the kind of adaptive autonomy that um, is fundamental to the inactive approach. So I think, yeah, it, it's a crucial distinction that you've, you've raised there. Um, there is a question as to whether or not you can have an adaptive autonomous system that is not also a chemical biological system. And there are some really interesting um, sort of developments in that. Again, this is in, in some of the more recent literature. Um, so Ezekiel de Paolo has a, a paper called Inactive Becoming in which he addresses some of this question uh, and in particular, he sort of phrases it or, or um, uh, sort of approaches it in terms of the, the replicants from Blade Runner. You know, or you, you can think about it in, in kind of any science fiction scenario where you've got a, a human-like um, android or even just a, a living-like um, artificial entity. Um, to what extent can we say or would we expect these to have uh, to be fully cognitive systems and what kinds of of, of questions should we ask in order to try and identify whether they are fully cognitive so but it, it's a it's a sort of a complex issue um, and was one of the uh, initial descriptions of autopoiesis so the the term autopoiesis has again it sort of slides around it has a few different interpretations or a few different um, glosses uh, the but in its uh, it, one of the initial formulations was that it, it was uh, autonomy in the chemical domain specifically, um, and therefore the, the concept of autonomy is uh, more broad and more abstract than that. And so it's possible to be autonomous in domains other than biological chemistry. And to the extent that that's possible, then we get into sort of really quite complicated territory. But it's something that is one of the things that we will, um, that an active approach does have to discipline. It has to, to figure out uh, a coherent and stance on this in uh, for no other reasons or, or if for no other reasons then it's you know it's the most profound ethical question um, that exists is you know the the extent to which you know uh, to what extent do we extend uh, ethical considerations to to the world around us and in, for a lot of people that comes down to the question of well is the thing alive is there a a, a perspective or a point of view that we must dignify here and so if we cannot answer the question, well, you know, what are the, the, the points of view in the world that we must recognize and respect, then um, there will always be deeply problematic limits to our ethical sensibilities. Thank you. Uh, can I add something? Um, sure. Yeah, and then uh, if it's if it's just to sort of follow up there, and and Zhao, I see has his hand up as well. But please, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, following up on the question of uh, computational modeling of cognition, which might be in dialogue with inactivism. I think it it's worthwhile also to mention the Bayesian approaches, which model. Uh, uh, so so it's a popular approach today to model cognition and perception as a kind of a generative 
process in which we don't ob uh, kind of uh, objectively uh, represent reality, but create our experience based on our prior uh, expectations and and predictions. I think this is a a uh, a popular approach today in in computational modeling, which resonates with some ideas of uh, of an activism in the sense that kind of experience is generated uh, through this uh, two way interaction with the world rather than uh, representing some kind of static uh, reality. Um, yes, thank you. It is, it's a, a very um, popular computational um, modeling system. I would be um, remiss if I didn't um, flag that there is controversy over it. Of course, the, the, there is a, a sort of an interesting literature in trying to understand what the potential implications are um, or potential relationship that exists between the Bayesian approaches, which are generally associated with Carl Thurston's work, uh, most explicitly in the area of cognitive science, and and uh, there's just a, a really quite broad literature around it, and um, the inactive approach in terms of the the life mind continuity aspects of it that arise from the work of Rayla and, and uh, Thompson in particular. So there is a for some, there is a sort of very clear and potentially close link and ways in which to mesh the two points of view. For others, um, they are fundamentally distinct and, and not really um, commensurate with one another. There's no way to bring them together because of the, the differences in um, underlying points of view about how cognition arises and what cognition is. Um, but it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's an interesting literature to dig into there. Um, the uh, Sean Gallagher's work, recent work in this area, Michael Kirchhoff's, um, Ines Hippolito and, and others on the kind of Bayesian side. And then there's a, an interesting paper by um, Evan Thompson, actually, Ezekiel de Palo, Evan Thompson and Randy Beer, um, who argue that in fact that these two points of view are not as, as clear, uh, basically they're not commensurate with one another, they have to be kept separate. Um, so Joe's hand has been up for longer, I think, but I'm not sure if that's it's just been left up for a while. No, just uh, yeah, just uh, because I am looking into the chapter, and I think something that uh, they said in the subchapter experience and computational mind can help us in what we are talking about, because uh, there is a phrase that they say in the page. Uh, one uh, 120 that is our cognition however seems to be directed toward the world in a way that intimately in, intimately involves consciousness i think uh and, and i would like to to hear your opinion marek because there is these two key, key concepts that that uh, came from from Varela's previous work and uh, and uh, is still going on until his death and after in Thompson's that is life and the uh, world as I experienced the world world that to me sounds uh, an an distinctive ethical position as you were saying about how why are you why are we studying a human life or human mind as a part of the life component and as a life uh, uh, an intentionally an intention toward the world and inside the world based upon the experience i think because um sometimes when uh uh, because I, I I tend to agree with you that there is some component that is epistemic and net an ethical uh, proposition that is underlining all all the book and all the 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 main ideas here that is not some procedimental problem. I think procedimental problems can be solved in a lot of procedimental ways. But 
there is this underlining ethical assumption that we are talking about what life is and what cognition is inside life. That is very distinctive from a lot of models. And one of them is the computational, comp computational mind model that was being studied at this time. So I would like to hear about what you think about this emphasis that Varela, Thompson and Hirsch put in the life itself and in a cognition that goes toward the world. Um, yes, thank you for that question. So it's an interesting that this will to touch on it's a, it's an interesting um, way in which it captures the particular historical um, bracket in which the book was published. So if we look at if if you look at the what came before the embodied mind and the development of um, Varela's thought and Mascherano's thought and and the the various uh, as they say in chapter three right there's a complex messy web of history that feeds into cognitive science as it exists at that point at the end of the 1980s, much of which had been lost, uh, much of which, you know, when you studied cognitive science in, in any of its disciplines at that point, you wouldn't have studied much cybernetics. Um, the, you know, cybernetics had sort of been absorbed into other engineering disciplines largely. And though it would all, you know, it would have come up in cognitive science work, it wouldn't have had as a sort of a richer presentation as uh, maybe would be needed for you to fully appreciate uh, how different in fact cybernetics was to computational cognitive science. The last semester of talks unpacks and presents a lot of those different threads in very useful ways. Um, and then, but then the, the embodied mind has a specific task set to it. Um, so that the, essentially there isn't time to unpack that kind of thread, um, but it's the that role for life and the, the the crucial grounding of cognition in autonomy is sort of present in that prehistory to the embodied mind or the the history leading up to the embodied mind, um, and then more or less doesn't really appear in explicit terms within the embodied mind itself. So the the term autopoiesis um, barely registers in the book. I'm not sure if it registers at all, actually. Um, but then resurfaces, um, sort of explodes back onto the scene in the early 2000s. Um, so Vrela's work through the 90s still references the, you know, the, the vitality of autopoiesis in um, the discussion of what an organism is and, and so on. But then a, a 2002 paper with Andreas Weber, who presented one of the, the talks last semester, um, in, the inactive approach is kind of entwined once again with the autopoetic literature and the, the sort of theory and, and point of view of autopoiesis. And in particularly, in order to stitch together um, the inactive approach with the phenomenology of Hans Jonas. And here we see the kind of the issue, the, the notion of metabolism as grounding value um, sort of surge into in active thinking, um, and it, it plays a massive role in the developments that all took place then in the early um, 2000s. And um, some of which again are addressed. Um, Evan Thompson's talk from last semester is a, a really superb in introduction to um, that kind of material as well, particularly in the, the later sections of the talk. So there is a, a kind of a really important thread that you pick up on um, there in your question, which um, is kind of more prevalent before and after the book, The Embodied Mind, um, but is nevertheless still in the background. It, it's still playing a role, which is this ethical, um, uh, the, the life-mind continuity thesis, as it's uh, now called, which is that which is living is, is mindful. Um, and then how can we sort of unpack that and, and come to terms with it? But in The Embodied Mind, the the focus is sort of kept uh, more specifically at the level of um, behavior, possibly just in, because that um, is in, in order to prevent having to deal with the mass, massive um, sort of rift of, or raft of implications that would need to be dealt with if you wanted to to really try and um, defend the the life mind continuity thesis um, uh, explicitly. Whereas in in the embodied mind, the emphasis is more on 
Merleau-Ponty's aspects of sensory motor activity and skillful behavior. Um, so, but I think it is, it's sort of very much around about the same time, um, Varela was publishing ethical know-how uh, and the um, Evan Thompson has always said that the uh, mind in life was essentially an, a, um, a, a development of, or an extension of um, the embodied mind. It, it, the precise details of it changed as um, the book progressed, but it started as a joint project in which uh, Varela and, and Thompson were looking to just sort of rework and represent the, that um, grounding in living um, that is fundamental to an active thinking, even if it isn't sort of fully represented in the embodied mind. Um, so I hope I hope that gives you some context. I think which um, might, on the one hand, the, I think it's true that the the broader project of uh, appreciating and respecting life and the ethical implications of doing cognitive science and the, uh, how to sort of address those ethical implications. Um, within our cognitive science properly is a fundamental underlying principle that just runs through the gamut of the book. It's, it's, it's there at every stage and is there again explicitly in both um, Thompson's and Rush's introductions to the revised edition. Um, but it isn't as ex sort of explicitly extrapolated um, in the text itself for pragmatic reasons, but then is, it, you know, very much plays a much more explicit role in a lot of the subsequent literature. Um, and I think it is um, it is very important to recognize it as a as an important part of an active cognitive science. Um, again, I, I hope that makes some kind of sense. Oshin has a has another follow up. Yeah, it's really just to um, kind of respond to what Atul said and some of the other stuff that was mentioned because I, I think what Atul said was, was interesting that he was thinking the inverse. Well, he was saying that he thought maybe from you know an AI's point of view, it's not symbols, it's just physical transformations. And I think there's a bit more subtlety in that statement because um, you, you know, well, there's, I think there's there's two things about it. You know, from our point of view, you know, they are physical transformations, but they're physical transformations which are designed. Uh, to represent or symbolize other things. I mean, as my understanding of Turing's original work was that he designed a theoretical device that would be able to represent and manipulate symbols. Um, and that's really the definition of what computability or a computer, uh, at least it's the definition of what a computer actually is. And so it's kind of in this strange situation that, you know, an AI is instantiated on a piece of physical hardware that undergoes physical transformations. But um, as computers are pretty much defined as uh, physical transformations that represent symbols. Um, it's kind of hard to hide the fact that there's something symbolic going on there. Um, and similarly, then I guess just this is more in a, a, a general discussion because I think a lot of people have been using AI, but maybe not quite differentiating between this idea of narrow AI and artificial general intelligence. Because of course, you said, you know, from the point of the AI's view, it's physical transformations, but there is no point of view from the AI as far as we know. Uh, it's just a bunch of physical transformations that we're interpreting as being some type of knowledge or information. Um, and really, the, it, it's all narrow at the moment, we, we think. And I guess the the project of general artificial intelligence, I guess, is more closely related to, as far as I can see, something being conscious. Now, people like Dennis Hazabis, who works for DeepMind, uh, the founder of DeepMind, thinks it's possible maybe we could build a general AI that's conscious or not conscious. And I think those things are fundamental problems and issues up for debate because we really don't know what consciousness is. Um, and I guess that's what all of this course is about and us exploring the very nature of what that actually even means. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's quite important that we try and differentiate between these narrow AIs and general AIs because even a lot of people within the field of artificial intelligence are, are using the, the word interchangeably, but they're referring to quite different things. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. It's, uh, like I said, uh, the term AI is just bandied about so much at this point that it um, it is very hard to keep track of, or you have to be very careful about your context, both when uttering it and when um, interpreting it. But it, it you get at a, a sort of a crucial point that I think feeds back into the earlier discussion as well, um, which is made explicit in the chapter um, which is that for the idea of 
cognition as computational processing to work, you have to be able to, in some way, make sure that your syntax produces your semantics. And the because the the, the computational processes themselves, these trans the, in this case not necessarily physical transformations, but um, the symbolic transformations, for those to work and be cognitive, the symbols themselves uh, and the the modes of manipulation have to uh, carry all the meaning um, and all the meaning that can possibly be right. Because um, if you get if you sneak meaning in any other way, then cognition isn't just computational processing anymore. And this is why we had so it's vitally important that the the syntax somehow encodes the semantics, but how that is done is not well theorized. Um, and in fact, again, there was a, a big controversy in 1990s cognitive science. Um, I, I feel like it's like. I feel like the old man sitting by the, the fire is like, oh, back in my day, we had this controversy. I keep referring back to 1990s, like it was a wonderful, um, I don't know what it was. It was just a period of time, I guess. So, but the, um, the, the controversy in 1990s cognitive science was called the symbol grounding problem, which is how do I take this symbol and make it meaningful? And interestingly enough, no one attempted to do it with semantics. All of the attempts were um, in terms of um, or sorry, none of it was, it was attempt to do it with syntax. All of the attempts was trying to find a way to associate it to perceptual activity or behavioral activity in some way. And, and this is one of the contexts in which um, embodiment first sort of blossomed as an issue that you could not get away from and had to take seriously. And the extent to which um, what is meaningful for a system has to come from somewhere other than the sets of rules that govern how symbols are manipulated um, is a statement about the limit of a, the cognitive thesis as an explanation for cognition. And um, it's one of the crucial, as Ezekiel de Paolo puts it, um, the blind spot, one of the crucial blind spots of traditional cognitive science is um, that there is no account of agency and meaning that can uh, that is sort of consistent and coherent, uh, whereas the inactive approach starts from sort of a clear statement of what it is to be cognitive, uh, which is to be an adaptive autonomous system, even though the actual the embodied mind itself um, doesn't necessarily tackle that foundation in as a, a sort of a explicit a manner as it might. Um, but it's also interesting that when the, there's been sort of question about the um, the hard problem of consciousness raised um, in the chat and, and discussion earlier. And in fact, you see the hard problem of consciousness show up in uh, explicitly in chapter three. So essentially the hard problem of consciousness is hard coded into the cognitive thesis. So on, on page 50 of the book there, um, it's page 118 of the PDF, if you're using the PDF. Um, Thus for cognitivists, cognition and intentionality or representation are the inseparable pair, not cognition and consciousness. As soon as you start using mediating representations, so you've broken that relationship, that directness of relationship between either the body and the world or the body and the mind um, or the mind and world, then you have, you've split the self as they put it, you've fragmented things. Um, and of course, if you think, well, I'm gonna focus on the meaning um, and as, um, as the cognitivists do, we'll, we'll focus on the symbols, the consciousness evaporates as an issue. And that means you've got a problem trying to get back in because the, the foundations of your discipline say that consciousness, you're not getting consciousness for free. It's not you know, part of what you're doing. Um, it's entirely separate to the, the processes that you are articulating as cognitive processes. So you, you, you're then kind of wondering, well, where did consciousness go? Um, how do we get it back in? And you, know, you might end up doing extreme things like saying it's a fundamental thing about the universe. There's this, you know, all, all of atomic things have um, consciousness aspects to it, um, which is me throwing shade on Chalmers. But it, it's, um, it's another 90s thing. Uh, don't worry about it. You don't really need to deal with it too much anymore. Um, so what the inactive approach wants to do really is find a way to bring all of these things together, to sort of recognize that they certainly in, in our experience or in the experience that we can officially, that we can clearly articulate, these things all do seem intimately intertwined um, and rather than separate them and, and, and sort of and then 
try and um, put them back together at a later time, just develop a science that keeps them together in the first place. Um, but doing so is, as we've seen, rather tricky, um, particularly in the face of many, many centuries of, of individualistic and, and certain kinds of analytic thinking in the Western tradition. Um, so I'm just looking at time and uh, we are running over, uh, but again, I've talked for too long. I, if there is anyone that wants to sort of lob any last sort of quick, and I, I mentioned brief, I know it's ironic when I say brief, but nevertheless, if, um, if anyone wants to ask any quick questions or, or throw in one last comment, please do so. I'm going to take that silence as we're grand, Marek. Um, so on that note, we will leave it there for today. I'll um, hopefully be able to be um, a little bit more active in the, the Slack than I have been over the last couple of weeks, but I'm, I'm certainly enjoying the conversations that are happening there. And I look forward to reading more of them. And then we'll see you in two weeks for chapter four, when uh, Antonino Rafoni will talk about the eye of the storm and the self that is fragmented will be um, thrown into some kind of maelstrom. Thank see you. you see you everyone in Thank two you. weeks. And feel free as well just to join us for our upcoming programs. If you're interested, these are public programs coming up. In just a week, we have uh, an EVA alumni talk with Dr. Anna Isaac Reeves. And we will have a very special, actually, film screening with uh, the director of a um, filmmaker on April 12th um, on Tukdam, which is post-death post experiences um, in the Tibetan uh, context. So you're welcome to, to sign up for these. And we will see you back, as, as Mark said, in two weeks for Dr. Antonino Rafone's talk. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Okay.